uh, focused on the material. Um, so last time we explored, ladies and gentlemen, some model free, theory free, as it were, um, if I can use the term in a particular way, um, ways of, of trying to reason about and uh, identify structure in, in data, in particularly time series data. Um, these methods are inspired by system science approaches in the sense that they use uh, something that is either formably provably mappable is a is diffeomorphic to is kind of is just the stretched version of, of whatever the underlying state space is, whether we know it or not, we typically don't. Um, or or it's a kind of a proxy for it. But it leverages our, our visual system, can allow us to reason about what's going on simultaneously across multiple variables in a way that a, a time series plot, even several of them, just it, it doesn't get there for us. Um, but today our quarry is a bit different. Um, those will accompany us and we're gonna be returning to those um, in, in, a, in a vigorous way late in the course when we look at CCM, which, which leverages these insights from Taken's embedding theorem in order to, um, to identify causal structure to the system, identify what's driving what. But, um, but today um, we're turning attention to the first step on, on a journey. Um, a journey that is going to leverage statistical and, and machine learning approaches um, that are that do involve some models of some sort with um, uh, with the, with system science techniques and particularly with uh, with real world data and some understanding of model structure. Um, we're going to be talking about a a, a task that's central to the, to the challenges modelers face. Um, we as modelers are, are building, um, building models that account for processes in the world, that characterize processes in the world. Um, and we build them as thinking tools. Um, so we'll stop us think more quickly, more robustly, more, more deeply and reliably about the world. And to learn about the world more quickly from when data is available. Um, but a key part of, of building most models um, is to bring together some level of face validity for the model in terms of representing something meaningful. Models are a lot more than data. There's, there's this old throwaway comment you'll hear again and again and again from people who don't understand modeling that you know, models are no better than the data that go into them. They're simply you know, garbage in, garbage out. Um, um, if, if the data's off, the model's totally off. Models are about a lot more than, than data nominally, than just columns of numbers. They're about structure and structure drives behavior. And I like to say structure in terms of the connectivity of the model. Um, drives structure in temporal behavior and in behavior in state space. Um, um, regularities and structure of the model are mirrored at some level at regularities um, in terms of behavior. Um, so we can't say that a, a model is just, you know, it, it can do anything if you put in the wrong data. It, it can match any curve. That's complete nonsense. Someone who says that just doesn't understand uh, the mathematics involved and they don't understand the, the, the role that structure plays in modeling uh, and, and doesn't understand modeling. Um, models are a lot more than, than just data. But you know we, we do have to sweat often putting, putting data into our models because we want them to be in some sense reflective of plausible, possibly have plausible fidelity to, to certain patterns in the world. And, we don't want to be capricious about our, our representations or, or really, really needlessly sloppy. So we put a lot of effort into 
to estimating components that go into our models. And, you know, it brings to the foreground the question, well, where are you getting these data assumptions, the assumptions about data? A model can capture a lot of regularities, even given big uncertainties about the data. There are certain features of the structure that will drive certain behaviors, say exponential growth and saturation, regardless of the vagaries of how quick exactly that growth is, it will still examine that, you know, show that pattern, still show cycles, um, you know, just a matter of how quick those cycles are, but it's, it's a model that produces cycles or produces overshoot and collapse or, or what have you, um, that exhibits great stability regardless of parameters. So parameters aren't everything, but they matter. They matter. And, and when we're trying to inform you know, uh, a firm understanding of why we see certain patterns in the world, a plausible explanation. Or when we're uh, trying to, 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 to anticipate where things might be going over the next little bit in terms of burden of long COVID or hospital admissions or hospital occupancy, you know, bed occupancy, census. Um, or if we're trying to ask what if questions that are technical in nature, you know, it, it behooves us to, to put a, a lot of effort into having assumptions that are plausible. Um, so where do we get this data from? I, I commented to a colleague um, um, uh, many years ago, uh, probably uh, somewhere upwards of 10, um, that as a modeler, I often feel like uh, I live the life of a, of a buzzard, uh, a, a data buzzard, a vulture. Um, I subsist off of the scraps of data that I can pick up on the side of the road, and, you know, roadkill from administrative data and, and, you know, the scraps and leftovers that, uh, uh, that, that clinicians toss at me or that happen to make their way into the literature. Um, little bits of data that, that leak out of, of, of the health system or what have you. And, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic um, has not, you know, eliminated the relevance of that analogy. Um, we're often very much just trying to find what we can to piece together the situation. But dynamic modeling is different. And a lot of people don't understand this. Dynamic modeling is different from a lot of other areas. Like, um, like risk analysis, where also we're depending on the data, but if, if we don't have the data, we say, well, you know, we'll roll belly up and, and, and say, well, we don't have the requisite evidence. I'm exaggerating some. We can do sensitivity analyses there too. But there's something that we have with dynamic modeling that we don't have there. The models have emergent behavior, and we can compare the emergent behavior of the models against empirical data. Um, we also will often have sub areas of the model where we might have data related to that sub area. Um, and if we can measure this data from the world, we can often estimate parameters in the model. Sometimes people just give us a parameter estimate. You know, they, we, we have really good estimates of, from primary data collection of, you know, what, um, of, of how long uh, it is between when someone is infected and when they develop symptoms, um, or just what fraction of the time, you know, people who are, uh, uh, who are diagnosed with a certain serious condition uh, live beyond uh, different uh, periods, of, you know, for different periods of time, the survival curves, Kaplan-Meier survival curves, or, 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 or other, plots related to survival analysis or competing risks or from recurrent events analysis. Sometimes we're given that data, but often we have to kind of like a buzzard, you know, a hunt, like sort of go and search it out and, 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 and grab it and, and, you know, tear it, tear off the, the bits of data and, and ingest them um, uh, uh, quickly, um, but, but after some preparation. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about some ways of doing this uh, today and, and on Monday. Um, 
uh, and, and variously, we're going to be talking about methods that allow us to take empirical data about infectious diseases of a very of a key point of, of, of a sort of, of a key type of, of a sort that is absolutely essential for um, health system interest, uh, practical decision making, namely uh, the basic reproductive number, um, how we can estimate it from real world data. Um, and, uh, and we'll see that that, it, that process involves some assumptions and some model ass structure assumptions. It's different from what we talked about on Monday, which well, there's no model assumptions there. Um, here there will be, but it kind of maps onto models in a more neat way. Um, you can, it's a very practical problem to kind of measure this empirical data, how quickly cases are growing, for example, and say, aha, the basic reproductive number must be this. Um, and, and that's what we're, we're gonna be talking about today. Um, but then we're gonna be going on to talk about calibration. And calibration is gonna be a way of trying to identify model parameters um, of whose value we lack great confidence by matching up model output, the emergent behavior of a model with empirical data. This is what I'm saying is, is something that's quite distinctive of, of dynamic modeling. It's not that we need to depend on, you know, having data specifically measured for every parameter we're dead in the water. No, 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 no. Um, we can actually estimate some parameters by comparing model output, these surprising output of models, uh, the emergent behavior, say over time, um, or in terms of state space, other features against real world data. And then we can arrive at plausible parameter values for that you know, parameter values that make what the model produces as close as possible to data. Calibration is the simplest, most age old, um, most ubiquitous way of doing this. And it's a very important way, so way in which we interface models with data. We'll be soon enough exploring with approximate Bayesian computation, with particle filtering and with particle MCMC, ways of doing this uh, even more richly, much more richly yet. But, but calibration will, um, will introduce a lot of the co core concepts that carry over to those spheres as well. So that was a bit of a preamble, a bit of a motivation, a bit, ladies and gentlemen, of a call to action. So with that preamble, let's dive into the work at hand, if we may. Um, OK, so. Uh, I will now switch to uh, a whiteboard, and, excuse me, a whiteboard, a, um, a set of slides. And let me uh, mumble. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll just have to, uh, have to deal with this. Um, uh, my, my Zoom window is stranded on one workspace and my, my slides are on another, but I think we can bear with it. Can you see my slides okay? Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, um, okay, so, you know, I like to speak um, uh, when, I, when I teach about modeling, um, uh, I like to speech, uh, speak about modeling taking place in a series of iterative processes. I'm a big believer in what I have termed over the past decade, agile modeling modeling that is embedded, that uh, seeks ongoing feedback, that is nimble and adjusting to uh, learning and change stakeholder demands, um, uh, and that reprioritizes, and that revisits earlier steps when required to broaden model scope or narrow its scope or, or refine how we approach a certain process uh, as represented in the model or what have you. And and I'd like to think of model as proceeding, model, modeling as proceeding from problem call, uh, conceptualization through to, through to sort of later stages. And two of these stages of particular importance are model formulation, where you're adopting the structure of a model and model calibration. And those form much of the focus for uh, this and the next lecture. Um, 
here in the model formulation side, I, I put in a rather innocuous way, specification, specification of parameters. Um, and, and that sounds, um, makes it sound uh, very easy. Like we simply, you know, say, assume this for that, that for that, and then for that. And indeed, whenever, whenever we have a model, you know, they're, they're typically a, a number of parameters. There, there are a lot more than just parameters. They're structure, and, and that structure makes all the world a difference. But the parameters are normally, you know, quite numerous. Um, we have to make assumptions about our, our parameters. Um, and in infectious disease models, it's the same. And, you know, you'll notice even the very simplest models we've been talking about, like the Kermick McKendrick model shown here, uh, the so called SIR model you know, has assumptions that need to be made about a set of parameters, um, C, beta, and mu. Um, and we can quibble and simplify things by noting, for example, C, beta are always multiplied by each other. And so we don't need two parameters to estimate. We can just estimate C, beta instead of estimating them separately. But, um, but we're still dealing with parameters to be estimated. Some of the later techniques we talk about, I should say, um, will actually show ways to further reduce the number of parameters. There's techniques based on dimensional analysis that can reduce the number of parameters um, significantly by, by allowing you to deal with ratios of parameters and so on. Um, uh, and as time allows, we'll, we'll come to those. But you know, uh, for our life as modelers, uh, with us as data buzzards, um, we, uh, we often need to go find estimates for our parameters. And you know, there's, there's many places we can go. We've got a surveillance data, you know, large scale um, survey instrument results, uh, outcome studies, um, outbreak data, reporting data from the health system. Um, uh, if we're lucky, someone's done a meta-analysis or systematic review related to this. There's, there's many, many spheres. Sometimes we turn to system practitioners for expert judgment. But I want to talk here about this last one. And um, this is one of about three lectures in the course, maybe four, where we're going to dive in to um, a little bit of more uh, substantial linear algebra. Um, uh, because with infectious disease models in particular, there's a particularly central need here to reason about the basic reproductive number. To early on in an outbreak, say a first outbreak of wild type in February, March, 2020, to look at that curve and say, what's the basic reproductive number? What is it telling us about this? And can we use that to then build a model of it um, that's, that's responsive and will help us start to grapple with what sort of challenge we're dealing with? Same thing has come up with Omicron because of its ability to, to break through uh, so much um, protection in terms of immune protection. Um, uh, I should note that, um, uh, you know, just to sort of put a cap on the data buzzard story, um, I made that utterance about me being a data buzzard in the context of, uh, I'm sick of being a data buzzard only. I'm sick of living off purely on scraps and, and you know, uh, uh, the most unseemly of meals. And uh, I want to move beyond that by becoming a, a hunter gatherer I want to I want to grow my own food I want to hunt it and I don't want to um, to be a buzzard all my life and it's partly for that reason that I've built several generations of big data collection systems which have indeed offered more salutary diet, diets for my models we can collect data on contact patterns of people over time instead of speculating about them. We can collect data on how long, for how long people are in contact with how many people they're in contact, you know, actual durations, uh, how those contact patterns change uh, under the event of lockdown or not. 
we can use social media data to inform an understanding of people's ideation and even some, to some degree their behavior or their symptoms. We can use uh, techniques from search, search data to, to better understand people's concerns, anxieties, et cetera. Um, so uh, I would suggest that those of you out there early in your careers, think about coupling your role as a modeler with some primary data collection using big data um, because the tools that you're learning in this course can be directly responsive for weaving the, uh, the data gained uh, via big data, um, the straw as it were from big data into gold um, like Rumpelstiltskin. Um, okay, so um, uh, I, know, I know some of you, your uh, hearts leap when you see matrices and others of your <laughs> hearts sink. Um, it's a bit like when I used to work in Africa as a field assistant on a field school. And um, one of the things we were told is when you yell snake, about half of people run away and half of people run towards it. Um, and it's, it's kind of similar, I think, with, uh, with mathematical notation. Uh, and I just want to remind you that um, when we're dealing with systems, uh, we can represent um, them using a, uh, a state vector. Um, uh, and so S here, which I've written lowercase s, is a state vector. For example, it might be capital S, capital I, and capital R. You know, that car characterizes the current state, for example. Or it might be S-E-I-R, or it might be S-E-I, well, S-E-I-R in, um, uh, in, in another context. Maybe we have uh, asymptomatic state in there, and et cetera. But we can, in general, write kind of the evolution of a system like that is S dot, the rate of change of S over time um, equals some function of the current state. This is almost the definition of a mathematically of, a, of a, what makes a dynamical system. It's evolution, it's time evolution. How the current situation in the system is changing depends on its current state. Um, if we have a different state, it will, evolve differently. Um, it'll do different things. If we have no infectives in the population, we can have all the susceptibles we want and it won't go anywhere. Uh, if we have infectives, it'll go very, very differently. So it's, its behavior depends on state. Now we can write this out and part of what's going on here is a bit of awkward notation, but I, I think it's important for me to emphasize this. This is a, a vector function of state, meaning it's a vector because there's one element of this vector for S, capital S, for capital I, and capital R, uh, for example. Um, and so we could write this out, for example, with a 3D system like this. Um, there's a scalar function, a function that just returns a number um, um, for, the, for whatever the X component is of this vector. That's a function of, of um, the current position. Uh, the, this function at the current position. There's a Y and there's a Z. So if we consider this at a certain point, that's what this little bar and, and a, this lower S star means. Um, uh, you know, if this is a 3D system, we might write it like that. Um, and it turns out that um, when you have a system like this, we can have it undergo what's called linear uh, linearization. Um, so you know, the rate of change at S prime, I'm oh, sorry, S star um, is just, um, or, or around S star, around S star, you know, some S that's nearby S star is the rate of change at S star, um, which we could write as, as this, um, uh, plus um, this, expression, which basically as we go departing from S star in a certain direction, we, we have a somewhat bigger, so maybe we're trying to assess the rate of change around the disease-free equilibrium where everyone is susceptible, nobody's infected and nobody's recovered. Um, as we start to say, well, now there's a few infectives, there's a few recovered, um, how does that change uh, the, uh, 
the rate of change of the system. That's what this matrix is. And this is called the Jacobian. And the first row of it is just saying, how does, how does, uh, how do, how does the, the value of this quantity um, vary with uh, each of the state variables? And, and the next row down is how does this one vary with each of the state variables? Um, now, um, and then we have some higher order terms. Now, I'm going to make this a bit more concrete to talk about a case of where we have something like x, y, z, okay? Um, so, so this is a state vector. Um, and here, if we have a state vector here, I, I was kind of speaking more generally, although I, I use this for illustration, but here, suppose we have S, X, Y, Z, um, and we have F of S here, the vector function of state, um, I know it may make your head hurt, um, is equal to F sub X. That's just the name of the, the first element of this, um, um, uh, which is a function of X, Y, and Z. And then Fy, which is a function of Fy and Z, and Fz, which is a function of Xy and Z. Um, and S dot is equal to this. In other words, X dot, Y dot, Z dot equals, um, uh, equals uh, you know, this, this function here. It's just this first component is telling us what the first, you know, what X dot is doing. The second element is telling us what Y dot is doing the third element is telling you what Z dot is doing. In other words, this is saying, what's the rate of change of X, um, you know, as a function of X of the state of X, Y, and Z. This one's saying, what's the range of change of Y as a function of X, Y, Z. This one's saying, what's the rate of change of Z as function of X, Y, Z. Okay. Um, so if we, if we take that, if that's our view, um, we can kind of apply this methodology here. And uh, what you find, and, and this is where it, uh, it starts to get more specific for where we're going to be dealing with, uh, with the case of estimating the basic reproductive number, because um, we're going to be doing it around an equilibrium. We could represent this whole system as, um, to, to think about a state right around S, some S star. We, we, we take the value of F at S star, and we add to it a term that says, as you, go, as you depart from, from S star, as you depart from this point here, S star is, is X star, Y star, Z star. So as we're kind of looking around S star, um, and we go in a certain direction, how does the value of this change as, as kind of a linear function of how we go? How does the value of this change? Um, how does the value of that change? So it's kind of like as we as we go in a certain direction around this, um, uh, the value of f of s is changing from what it is strictly at f star by by this amount. Um, and if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If if you want to um, stretch your mind around this, if if we put say this is call it delta x, okay? This is how much x has changed from from X star. This is how much X, Y has changed from Y star, from Z, from Z star. Okay. Um, uh, then, then we could think of this whole matrix as being times delta X times delta Y times delta Z. Z. And um, it turns out that that will mean that delta X will, will multiply by these terms here. Um, so the first one will multiply by this and it'll be saying, okay, so this is how quickly this guy goes up as I change X. And then I'll multiply by the change in X. Okay, great. And that, that's gonna give me how, how, how quickly this rate of change of, of, and with respect to time of, um, of, of this component uh, is going to, to be increased. And, and Y is going to be multiplying by, by this row here. And each of these, the, uh, sorry, this column, and each of these rows is going to tell us how this change in Y, yeah, how it, how it um, increases uh, this, uh, this component um, uh, for, so that's what this row is telling us as I make this, uh, the second one as I, as I change Y. Um, 
So, so you can puzzle that through, but we'll come to the very particular case, which simplifies it of, a, of an equilibrium. If X star, Y star, Z star, this point around which we're, we're, we're reasoning about how this whole thing changes. If, it, if that point is an equilibrium, if it's a very special point, this S star, if that's an equilibrium, oh man, we're, we're in great shape because we know um, by definition, um, the rate of change at an equilibrium is zero. So f of s at an equilibrium is zero. Um, f of s star, where f, s star is in equilibrium is zero. So all these things equal to zero. So this whole term goes away um, if we're at an equilibrium. And all we have is this. That's all we got, this, this, this linear term. We say, as we go away from the equilibrium in a certain direction, in the x direction, mm, how does s, uh, how does, uh, X dot change. Well, it's um, as, as we've left, okay, it's delta X times the rate of change of, 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 this, of uh, this one and, and X, there shouldn't be a vector thing over that, um, uh, plus the rate of change in how, how, how we're going and why the displacement there from how this thing changes as we change Y. Um, and then Z times how this thing changes as we change as we change Z, um, and we sum them all up. And and the second row is how this one changes as we change X, um, and then we multiply it by the change in X, and how it this one changes as we change Y, multiply it by the change in Y, and this how this changes as we change. Z and then we multiply by the change in Z and and those together tell us how much this component changes as we're kind of displacing um, in an X Y Z around this equilibrium um, and and the same thing for the last the last kind of row of, of this um, so so this is saying around an equilibrium it's the linear linear effects rule. And we have some higher order terms. That's what the hot is. Uh, they're higher order terms um, uh, in my lingo. Um, so uh, this, is, this is a situation which we often use to kind of analyze behavior around an equilibrium. Um, we kind of say around an equilibrium, it's dominated by this Jacobian matrix. Um, and we can analyze kind of its behavior there. So now let's apply this to the Kermick McKendrick model. Um, and believe me, this is all getting to estimating basic reproductive number. Um, here's our Kermick McKendrick model, S I R, right? Here are our equations. Okay, all we're going to do is we're going to apply this whole stuff to this case. So the state vector S is just S, capital S, capital I, I capital R. This is, Little case S is just indicating state vector in general. This capital is the number of susceptible. I is number of infective. R is number of recovered. Um, F of S here, well, that's, that's this vector function of this. That's just a fancy name for each of these components. So the first of them is, uh, is here, actually it should be an M, M minus this. Um, the second one is just, just this, that's, that's what this function is, the function of state. It says, how much does I dot change as a function of state? Well, it, that's what it tells us, right? It's C times I over N times beta times S minus I over mu. Um, and this one tells us how does R, the, the rate of change of R depend on system state? Well, it's I over, I over mu. Okay, great. Um, that's what uh, that's what f of s is. This this fancy thing which looks so scary at, at first. It's just bundling these things up into a kind of a, in a vector form. Okay, fine. Um, so it's a it's a function of state. Now, if we're um, dealing with uh, an equilibrium, if we're dealing with a uh, an equilibrium, um, say uh, s S star, I star, um, um, R star, um, then 
we can just recognize the behavior depends on the Jacobian of this thing. That's what this thing was. Um, uh, at that point, times delta s, delta i, dot delta r plus these higher order terms. So, so at an equilibrium, s star, i star, r star, all we do is we take the, the Jacobian of this. Um, this is the, the formula for it. Partial, oh, this should be partial. This should be f sub s, f sub y, sorry, f sub i, f sub r. I, I left them in their original notation, but this would be f sub s. It's just this guy here. Um, f sub i is this guy here. They're written right there. Um, so this is Jacobian and it says, okay, well, how much does this thing change as we change s? Yeah. And how much does this thing change as we change i? Yeah. And how much does this thing change as we change r? Yeah. And, and then we'll multiply by the delta S, delta I, delta R. It'll be this times that, plus this times that, plus this times that. And it tells us how much this whole thing changes as we go in this direction, right? Um, now, since we're at S I dot, S dot, I'm sorry, S star, I star, R star, since that's where we're examining around, we just plug those into Jacobian. So we take the Jacobian and we, plug in. And, and you can see the form of the Jacobian here. Um, the Jacobian has this form um, uh, that mirrors this first term. Here in the upper left, it's partial F sub S. That's what this thing is, partial S. So we take the partial derivative of this. All it's going to do is we, we treat this whole thing as a constant. And so we're saying we take the derivative of that with respect, like a constant times s with respect to s, guess what? We get the constant. There it is. It's this thing without the s, right? And then this term here is this guy taking the partial derivative with respect to i. Okay, well, we treat everything except i as a constant, and we take the derivative of i, guess what? It's just a constant. So it's minus c times 1 over n, because the i yeah, I disappears when we take the partial derivative and then b times s star. You'll notice that these depend on the state. This is i star. It's dependent on the state. The value of this Jacobian in a nonlinear system, it's going to depend on system state. If it were a purely linear system, which this is not, if it were purely linear, the value of the Jacobian wouldn't care about the system state. It'd be invariant under system state. But because it's a nonlinear system, we have i times s. It's the nature of communicable diseases. We have that. Um, the Jacobian, the value of the Jacobian is going to depend on you know, our position in state space. OK. Um, we're going to do a similar thing here. And you know, we're going to take the derivative of, of this guy for f sub i partial s, take the derivative of this with respect to s. OK, so it's just. Hey, this guy doesn't vary with S at all, so it's zero. Um, this one, it's just C times I over N times beta, and we're at I star, so we, we just do that. Um, and we take the derivative of this guy with respect to I, yeah, and we get this. And then we take this with respect to R. There ain't no change with respect to R. And then finally, we, we have this guy, and the only thing that that varies with is I, and not with R. Okay. So, so this is our Jacobian matrix. And we, of course, we can simplify it a little bit. Um, uh, and uh, we will. We can get rid of the zero, for example. But this is our Jacobian matrix for an arbitrary S star, I star, R star. Mm. Mm. Um, OK, so this kind of tells us as we, as we go in a certain direction around an equilibrium, Maybe it's disease-free. Maybe it's endemic. How does the kind of rate of change of, 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 of this thing with respect to S change as you go away from that equilibrium? Well, it depends on the location of the equilibrium. Um, we're going to go in and, and start to talk about a disease-free equilibrium now. A disease-free equilibrium. Now, here I'm going to engage in a little bit of of, of, of sleight of hand, I mean, to simplify the situation, it's easy. Often we'll say, hey, look, 
instead of totally out counts of people in these states, let's just deal with the fraction of the population that's in the state. So we'll, we'll say S plus I plus R total is, is equal to one. Um, we'll just be dealing with a fraction at any time of people that are in this state. Um, and so N equals one. And, if, and we're gonna focus on, because for a basic reproductive number, our interest is in understanding how does the system behave around the case where everyone is essentially susceptible. We just have one stinking infective and you know, 30 million people in Canada who are susceptible. You know, it's the beginning of SARS-CoV-2 spread in Canada. One person who flew in from Wuhan, I know, because I studied their case. Um, um, uh, you know, basically that disease-free equilibrium occurs essentially at S equals one. The entire population is susceptible. There's no infectives and there's no recoveries. Okay, so I have this, this formula for the Jacobian, as you see here, also mirrored here. So I could just plug this in. I mean, th this was expressing What's the Jacobian around any equilibrium at, at something S star, I star, R star? And now we have a very particular equilibrium. S star is one, I star is zero, R star is zero. So we just plug it in, just like that. Um, and uh, so we plug in one for, uh, for S star. Um, and it's gonna, the only place it kind of goes in and it's there. Uh, we plug in zero for I, and boy, does that clean things up that wipes out this term, boom. Um, and it wipes out this term, boom. Um, and, uh, and then it, um, uh, and, and then, you know, uh, R, R is zero, but we don't have any R terms here uh, to worry about uh, either. And so what we end up getting is this, at the disease-free equilibrium. So what have we done? Um, what have we done? Um, uh, well, why am I going through all of this? Well, look, we're trying to understand how the system behaves in this very particular case of a disease-free equilibrium, because we want to understand how the system, how infection spreads when only when everyone is susceptible. And, and by extension, we, we just have, you know, one puny index infective that essentially is ignorable in the sea of susceptibles. Uh, and um, when I say ignorable, um, it's a set, we're essentially at this state with a tiny, 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 tiny fraction being infective, this initial one. We want to know how does it behave? Um, how does it grow? Because we want to be able to look at empirical data and relate it to the quantities in the model, to, to the values of these parameters. If we have a formula, if we have a formula for how the infection will grow for this case, when we have, you know, everyone susceptible and, and just, you know, one index infective coming in and infecting, if we could figure out a formula for how it could grow in terms of C, beta, and mu, um, we'll be in great shape because we'll be able to measure the, the, the slope of that curve, the rate of growth of that curve, the slope of the log of that curve. And, um, and we'll be able to figure out something about maybe what, what C beta or mu is, or maybe about what the basic reproductive number is. So that's, that's the goal here. So we're trying to figure out how does the system behave at disease-free equilibrium, at a state where everyone is susceptible? Um, and how does it behave in the next little bit, sort of so we can deal with this linearization? So we're gonna get a closed form expression, a kind of uh, uh, an expression we can write down about how it behaves. So we had to go back and do all this stuff with theory about how it behaves around an equilibrium because our interest is in the very specific disease-free equilibrium we found it involves this thing called the Jacobian matrix. And we figured out the Jacobian matrix for our system in general, um, I, at a certain point, it depends on our location in state space. Of course, we're interested in the very particular point where S, dot e, S star equals this, this very particular equilibrium. So we plug it into this and that gives us a Jacobian. 
Okay, we're almost there. We're almost there. Now we have this Jacoby and it's going to say, how does the system behave? Uh, it's going to sell and by extension, it's going to tell us how it grows. And there's two ways to do this. One more general and one kind of slick for this case. I'll do the slick one first. Um, but, um, uh, but then we'll, we'll talk about the general one, which you can do through Wolfram Alpha or Mathematica or Maple or program of your choice. Um, um, okay, so remember we have this and remember how delta S, delta I and delta R just sort of are change here around the disease free equilibrium. Okay, this is a Jacobian. This is Jacobian at the disease free equilibrium. And what this is telling us, gosh, what this is telling us is that, um, uh, that uh, I mean, Jacobian is basically saying, let me get rid of this little thing. Um, Jacobian is, is right, get, get out, how about black spot? Um, it, the Jacobian is saying, okay, if we have S dot, I dot, R dot, remember, remember this idea with the Jacobian, uh, at, an, at an equilibrium, the rate of change of state, S dot, I dot, R dot, is equal to right around the, the equilibrium. Yeah, it's the displacement in S and I and R times this Jacobian. The Jacobian says, as we, as we kind of go and, and S, I and R around there, it gives us an expression for how S dot changes with this first one. It's this times delta S minus that time, times uh, I, um, and, and no change as a result of R. That will tell us how S dot is changing. Yeah, so, so what we have is this equals this Jacobian times, um, uh, times uh, th this uh, delta S times delta R delta I. And delta I is just I. It's whatever, whatever value we have in the vicinity because I star is zero and we're just examining around that. It's whatever value I is, this is a placement from zero in this direction. So what this is saying is I dot is approximately equal to zero times S minus one plus C beta minus mu, that's the second term in the Jacobian, times I plus zero times R. That's how matrix multiplication by a vector works, right? When we just, it's this one, so, so it's this one times delta S plus this one times delta I plus this one times delta R. And here we have these two zeros, so those knock out that and that. And this one is times, uh, times the I. So what this is saying is I dot, the rate of change of I is basically proportional to I. Oh my gosh. It's proportional to I with this constant. This is a constant, ladies and gentlemen. It's just a stinking constant. This is a number. It's a scalar number. C beta minus one over mu. Now, does anyone recognize those, some on this call have taken differential equations courses formally. Does anyone recognize if you have an equation, it's like, you know, I dot equals some constant, call it alpha times I, what sort of behavior does that give rise to? To what sort of behavior does that give rise? Can anyone speak, perhaps even in a stentorian voice? Exponential growth. Exponential growth. Stentorian indeed and fittingly in front of uh, Athens. Um, okay, so it's exponential growth. And what is the exponential growth here? Well, it's the rate of exponential growth is alpha. It's, it's C beta minus one over mu. Um, so, so um, we can, I mean, just, just kind of rearranging it and, and doing a bit of high school algebra, this is equal to C beta mu minus one over mu, right? I, all I did is I, you know, both these cancel and you get C beta and this is minus one over mu, right? I just, I just put this all over mu. Um, and Guess what this is? Does anyone recognize this from the SIR model? What is this quantity? What is that? It is the R, what? R zero. 
Yeah, it's R0, it's the R0, it's the basic reproductive number. Ladies and gentlemen, the rate of growth of, of, the, of, of, of a, a system which is described by the SIR model around the disease-free equilibrium, the rate of growth that we see is, is R0 minus one, the basic reproductive number minus one divided by mu. And, and what is mu? Can anyone remind me? What is mu here? What is mu? What, what role does it play? Latent time of uh, infectious. Yeah, it's actually, yeah, it's the time of infectiousness, how long they're infectious. Not, latent time would be if they were in a exposed state, a state, but this is the time they're infectious, how, for how long they're infectious. So, if, so, so what this is saying is the very start of the outbreak, we're gonna observe exponential growth at this rate. And, and it kind of makes sense if you think about it. Um, uh, you know, the longer someone stays infectious, the longer they have to kind of infect these R0 people. Remember, uh, R0 is the number of people they'll infect over the entire course of their illness if they're surrounded by susceptibles. We are surrounded by entirely susceptibles here. That's, that's why we're assuming this. And this is how long they have to infect them. And so it kind of makes sense sense if if they are going to infect a ton of people over the course of the illness because they have a super long illness it's going to grow a bit less slowly they you know more slowly they, they have plenty of time to infect those those people and so it won't grow as quickly if they got to infect them in one stinking day if mu is one you know and they got to infect 10 people they better get cracking and it's got to grow it'll be growing really quick right it'll be spreading like gangbusters um so, so it kind of makes sense that you have to divide by this. If this were latent TB and your time of infectiousness is the rest of your life, um, man, you, you have a, a long time to infect those people. It won't grow as quickly. Um, but the significance should, of this should not be, it should not be launch, lost on us. Um, what we're saying is that the rate of growth um, when we have an outbreak from a population that's entirely susceptible, as all of our societies were, no matter where you live in the world, you know, when coronavirus first came to town in, in 2020, that rate of growth we can use to estimate the reproductive number. Um, if we also have an estimate of this, how long people are infected for. Um, so the more, and, and I'll just, Note, and, and then I'll come back to a more general way. That was the kind of slick way. Um, but uh, in general, um, you know, we're gonna, uh, for, for this model, we, we would see a, a rate of growth. And if we can just estimate this, this rate of growth, how quickly it's occurring, if we can do a regression on it and find, oh, this is doubling every three days or something, we can go, from that, and if we could just get an estimate of the duration of infectiousness, you know, is it two weeks? Is it two days? Um, is it two years? We can estimate what the basic reproductive number is um, because we can measure the rate of, of growth. Um, now, I did this in kind of a, a bit of sleight of hand here. Um, not quite sleight of hand, but I, I did it in kind of a, a very particular way. The more generally general way is we take the Jacobian. Remember, we had figure out what the Jacobian is uh, in in general, um, and uh, and we could take it and we could determine the value of it as disease free equilibrium. You know, we where we we have this, we substitute in. Everyone's susceptible and nobody else is in any of the other compartments. Okay. Um, we plug it into our Jacobian and then we compute the eigenvector. Um, and of course, you don't have to do this by, by hand these days, but you could go tell your favorite symbolic mathematic package, Sage, uh, you know, Wolfram Alpha, uh, Mathematica, Maple, what have you. You could say, hey, go go figure, go compute the largest eigenvalue um, and as an expression involving the parameters. So I, I went and did this um, and, uh, 
and here I I took this Jacobian matrix and I plugged it in to well from alpha and I said take the eigenvalues of it um, and I got back this which is exactly what we derived here it's it's that, that that's the eigenvalue which and and the eigenvalue says basically well, how the modes will expand and this is saying that there's this expansive potentially expansive mode if r not is greater than one then it's going to be expanding exponentially here around this disease-free point okay so that's that's pretty cool um and for those who you know for whom the significance of this is is may not be obvious yet. I, I just want to note, you know, if we were to look at New York City uh, early on in the COVID-19 pandemic, you'd find something that looks pretty darn like exponential growth for the first, num you know, first bunch of weeks here, um, days. Uh, um, you know, first, first few weeks um, of, of this. Days are shown on the x-axis, but it's first few weeks of it. So it looks kind of like exponential growth. Uh, this from Waves of infection in Hoteng province in um, in South Africa. Forgive my poor pronunciation of it, but um, you'll notice that um, um, we have these successive waves uh, that are shown, and, and and at the beginning they look pretty exponential, especially this Omicron wave, which um, is you know growing in a particularly uh, 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 particularly obstreperous and even. Uh, uh, sort of effusive fashion. Um, uh, or this is another graph from South Africa from the um, uh, Discovery SA uh, analysis. Uh, this is in UK, um, you know, from uh, Omicron, from John Bur Murdoch, um, you know, showing in different areas. Oh, and, and you again start to see a certain plausibility. Mind you, this is not an entirely disease free equilibrium, but you see the fact that, in honest to goodness, empirical data, um, you know, you can very much see the exponential curves, Denmark, you know, for the Omicron, uh, Norway for Omicron, US cases in, in, um, in hospitalizations for, um, uh, for uh, you know, various, various states. And early on in these outbreaks, you often get exponential growth. Okay, now, um, what this is providing us a way to do then is to Kind of estimate a rate of a uh, rate of growth, and turn that into if we could just reasonably estimate the duration of infectiousness, say through clinical examination of cases and following them, um, we we get our ticket to estimate basic reproductive number. Um, that's cool, but it bears in mind keeping in mind some some caveats. Um, uh, the derivation uh, for the rate here depends on the structure of the model. You know, I went through this whole song and dance, um, uh, and uh, I'm not sure, you know, they were e either an enlivening song nor a uh, uplifting dance for many of you. But, you know, we went through this all um, with all this matrix algebra that was very specific to a model, right? Um, don't lose track of the dizzying set of matrices that all these equations are pretty specific to our model structure that we're assuming. Um, in contrast, you know, to the methods we explored on Monday, where we're not pausing any model structure, we're looking at the data on its own terms and, and you know, the patterns in the data, the trajectories in the data, the, the bends of the curves in the data in state space plots, um, using proxy measurements for state space or, or, or using delay embedding for measurements. Here, we're, we're actually, we've derived this rate of growth, this formula for the rate of growth and how it depends on, um, how the rate of growth depends on the basic reproductive number based on some very specific model assumptions that it's an SIR model. Um, so that's uh, one um, caution here. And, and I'll just say, I. Um, uh, if, if any of you are undergoing pain for this, uh, uh, please know that I, I put in um, uh, many, many hours, not, not painful, but, uh, but long and, and um, uh, very, very uh, 
uh, particular to to create these. And um, late late last night, I was I was creating um, uh, creating these slides, and uh, I. I, I went through and I said, okay, I, I just have to do this SEIR model too, um, somewhere between 1 a.m. and, and, this, and, and uh, just before lecture. Um, and, and so uh, I, you know, I created the, uh, uh, the matrix, the Jacobian matrix, and I derived it, and, and, I, and I derived what it is at disease free equilibrium, and we could solve the eigenvalues. And you see something um, that what it, um, uh, you know, what it lacks in, um, in beauty, it, it makes up for in, um, uh, uh, in quantity. Um, so uh, here, uh, when we have an SEIR model, just one more stock, you know, to reflect latently infected people, we actually have a, a profusion of terms. Um, lest you think that this prevents us from doing this, you can actually go through and this is the growth rate that will be empirically observed. This is the growth, this is the eigenvector, uh, or sorry, the eigenvalue, and it's the growth rate that will be observed empirically um, uh, around the disease-free equilibrium. And, and we can uh, solve uh, this for beta in terms of the, the growth rate and all these other things. And I've called the growth rate lambda here following uh, uh, Juling Ma. Um, uh, treatment that I posted. I posted a, um, a link for those interested in going into this in more detail uh, from Junling Ma at the University of Victoria. I posted that to the uh, course site, the Canvas site. And so I solved this for beta in terms of the observed growth rate and all these other parameters. And, um, and then, you know, reflected, okay, if we could solve for beta, um, we know this model has a basic reproductive number the same as the previous one, beta times C times mu. And so if we multiply this times C, C mu, because this is beta, we multiply it by C mu, then we just get this thing. And this is the empirically observed growth rate here. And you know these are the, the mean latent period here, these tau and, and mean infectious period is mu. Um, so once again, it, it kind of gives us a way of estimating the basic reproductive number if we could just get some clinical data on latent periods, um, how long it is between when someone's infected and when they become infectious, um, or how long between when they become infectious and when they, uh, when they recover from infectiousness. If we can do that and we can have an empirically observed growth rate, we're off to the races. Um, we can go and uh, estimate basic reproductive number. So, th so that's nifty, but there's some, there's some other um, cautions here or, or limitations or uh, provisos that I should note. Um, number one, um, uh, this is assuming that this is spreading freely. I mean, if, if we wanna calculate or not, you know, how many people in infective can infect you know, in an otherwise totally susceptible population within, you know, by their normal behavior circulating with no interventions. If we want to know, you know, how bad can it get? Um, we're assuming no interventions are in place on this initial outbreak. And, you know, um, here and in many other jurisdictions, uh, because of early modeling that was done, the early cases were observed when there were restrictions in place. So one needs to take that into account. Um, but you know, we need to look for other places where maybe they weren't in place, like from Wuhan, China initially, or from um, parts of Italy, uh, uh, Lombardia, et cetera. Um, uh, we are assuming at least a constant fraction of all cases are detected. If not all, then, uh, then, then a certain fraction. And, you know, if there's highly variable testing capacity, um, uh, for example, in Wuhan, China, um, they ran out of uh, the ability to do tests early on. They started to depend on um, uh, lung, you know, uh, chest X-rays, for example, and and that really confused the diagnosis numbers. In other words, the the case count because it delayed a bunch of diagnoses, and and so you can 
you can really run afoul of, you know, being able to really quantify um, how many people are, are sick at a given time. Um, we're assuming that th our estimation is robust given statistical variability, which will inevitably be there. All you have to do is take a look at some of these series and you can see, you know, indications of variability. And then finally, you need care in terms of dependence of, of estimation on the, the parameters involved. And particularly if you are um, estimating or not, um, uh, excuse me, if, if you're estimating uh, the, um, the recovery time from infectiousness um, uh, in a way that is dependent on um, your empirical, empirical data, your observations, uh, that could pose problems. Um, my understanding is, and I'd have to go back and derive why this is, that you have to be careful about essentially the dependence in your measurements of the various parameters. So if they're from the same population and you've got the same intertwining of assumptions, that could pose a, pose a problem here uh, if you have a complicated expression like this particularly. Um, so one has to be cautious about you know, using these, these estimates in ways that you're not shoving under the rug some statistical dependencies that would change these results. But that being said, this is bread and butter technique. So um, you know, probably this technique was applied thousands of times using either this formula or, or uh, this formula um, in the opening months of the, co the COVID-19 pandemic to derive what is the basic reproductive number in jurisdiction after jurisdiction. And I'm going to ask you for an exercise, ladies and gentlemen, um, to, uh, to go and undertake a, uh, a similar analysis um, with uh, some data. Uh, that I'll be providing using one of the popular libraries for doing this. Uh, it's a uh, librarian R, and um, I think we'll arrange it to make sure UN's first R session um, um, can occur before that, uh, that exercise is due. And UN is uh, familiar with and applied in this very province, um, this library from R to derive the an estimate of the basic reproductive number in the opening months of the pandemic. Um, so uh, she could, you know, show you a little bit of, of what you'll need to, to do that for sure. Um, it, as we've emphasized, it's not, ladies and gentlemen, without its uh, limitations and assumptions, but it's one of the best ways we have of, of trying to arrive at an estimate of something that's very important for modeling, the basic reproductive number. And because the basic reproductive number reflects C beta and, and uh, mu, um, or you know, tau as well uh, in the SEIR context, this paves the way for taking measurements from the world, um, some clinical, some public, based on public health data, using tools of statistics to analyze them, estimate um, some numbers from them, and then arrive at those numbers that can plug into our model. Um, and uh, we do so in a way that um, is routine when we're dealing with new, um, new, new infections, um, new diseases. Um, so uh, that's all uh, for uh, today. Um, I'll just note that this is indicative of a common, a common place when we're modeling. We have data that doesn't directly give us a parameter value, but it gives us hints as to what that parameter value is. And maybe it gives us a value for a combination of parameter values, like uh, C beta mu minus one over mu, um, uh, or that larger expression from SCIR. Um, and very commonly, we, we take empirical data and we say, you know, I could probably plausibly derive this parameter with some, some assumptions 
from the data I have um, by going through this backing out process, it's sometimes called, um, to sort of figure out what must this be to be consistent with that data? What must these parameters be? Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that next time, just for a few minutes to give you a flavor of that, because it's extremely common in the lives of us modelers using a bit of statistics or a bit of algebraic manipulation to arrive at estimates of parameters. But then we'll be going into a much richer subject, calibration, where we are using, again, empirical data, but empirical data about um, emergent behavior of a system to engage in parameter estimation that can be automated, semi-automated, or undertaken manually. Um, where we adjust the parameters we're, we're, whose values we're hoping to estimate so that the model behavior matches empirical data as closely as possible, given model structure. That's where we're going next time, and that will lay the groundwork for things like um, ABC, particle filtering, particle MCMC, MCMC, um, and um, uh, but we'll be we'll take a look at hidden Markov models to clue us in um, even sooner to some of those. So thank you very much for your patience. Um, I'll again take a break for a couple minutes, and I look forward to office hours. Thank you very much.